Welcome to the Tuning School of Regulation interviews. Today with me, there is Melton Baji Zakaya, that is head of Department of Strategy and Development at the Turkish Competition Authority. And she is also in charge of analyzing digital markets, a topic that we at the Tuning School are particularly interested in from the point of view of the analysis and uh, of teaching too. Meltem in the past has been, and I hope she will be also in the future, a teacher at our summer school on regulation of local public services that COVID-19 has postponed uh, to, 2000, uh, uh, to 2021. And uh, so it's a particular pleasure to have you Meltem today here. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, I'm Franco Beckis, Scientific Director of the Turing School of Regulation. The issue of our conversation is uh, in a way complicated and simple because the issue is digital market platform regulation uh, and uh, from competition and antitrust point of view, there is a lot of development at policy level, both in European Union and in United States that we will discuss today with Meltem. Let me just uh, say that the Tuning School of Regulation is uh, completing uh, uh, a work of microeconomic analysis of platforms, uh, which kind of animals are these players, these new players, in order to suggest uh, better policy options, both in the competition field and in the regulation field. Uh, I would start, Melton, with a, a very basic question. Uh, that is, uh, why the traditional instrument of competition uh, policy and uh, regulation policy seems unable to cope with the, the disruptive effects of the platform and digital markets? Thank you, for, uh, Franco, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, let me thank you and Turing School of Regulation for having, uh, for having me. I have been collaborating with Turing School of Regulation in, uh, I, it's almost been a decade by now, almost a decade. And I'm always honored to be part of uh, your uh, teaching sessions, be it physical or uh, webinars. This year, unfortunately, we never had the chance to meet up physically and we never had the chance to do the summer school, but hopefully next year, who knows? So uh, thank you again for having me and thank you again for choosing the uh, topic, which is quite trendy and which is indeed, as you have very rightly said, not, uh, easy and quite complicated at the same time. So let us start <coughs> answering and uh, repeating your uh, phrase. These platforms, as you rightly uh, made them resemble to animals. You are right, because all the new economy, and now we, we say that taming the big tech. So when you tame the big tech, you sort of implied what they, they may be. So you had a real point. And let us start by saying why the, the traditional tools and traditional uh, work that we have been doing in competition and regulation areas are not fit for these digital platforms or online platforms or multi-sided platforms, whichever you like. Let us say online platforms and let us copy the wording of the European Commission. First of all, in the last decade or so, we have seen an enormous growth in the area of digital economy, especially in digital platforms. And these platforms have main characteristic 
which doesn't resemble anything we have seen in traditional economy, traditional markets. What are these? The first one is the speed, and the second one is the information asymmetry. Speed makes it impossible for us as enforcers, competition enforcers, and as regulators and scholars to understand and to come up with policy suggestions. Because when we start a case, let us tell you my expertise, when we start a case, we have deadlines and everything uh, starts from months to years. So it may take at least a good three months time to two years time frame to close down a case. But we, with digital area, you don't have that much time. Things change from today to tomorrow morning. We've never seen this speed before. I don't think the world has ever seen the world economy. You must know better than me that the world economy has never seen such a growth and such a speed before. So when we start designing a policy, we seem to be already lagging behind what the real like, actual economy is. And the second is asymmetric information. We don't know what's going on in digital world indeed. When we try to understand what's going on, we just started talking about artificial intelligence, how the system works, they come up with a new system. So then we, we seem to be helpless. This is why we seem all over the world, uh, competition enforcers and policy designers, regulators, they're all trying to find a new way. That leads us to the point, to the standing where we are now which is the standing of the European Commission, especially the commissioner, Mrs. Lesteger. She's, a, she's quite keen on taming the big tech. And she says, we need a change of paradigm. We have to change our mindset because the classical approach doesn't, is no longer fit. The, the structure of these online platforms makes it impossible for us to come up and to deal with what they are doing. Let me give you a very simple example. Who would have thought that any company or any platform like Facebook, what is Facebook? Indeed, Facebook, as in, it was in the past, in the almost three, 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 six years ago, it's just a social network. You don't pay for Facebook. It's priceless. You don't pay. It's free. You think it's free as consumers. And then Facebook bought the famous, uh, there, there was a famous merger with, uh, of Facebook with Instagram in the year 2012. Facebook bought Instagram for $1 million. And then it doesn't stop there, it continued. A few years later, in the year uh, 2014, Facebook this time bought WhatsApp for 16 billion US dollars. And Facebook doesn't create any content and people and competition enforces that time thought that was a really simple merger just between two companies. And now Facebook became one of the, one of the uh, five big, big. So we're talking about now Facebook bigness. And Facebook not only bought these two companies, but already bought more than 80 companies. Yeah. Not only one. So we have never seen in the past or in the classical traditional economy, we've never seen any company buying and being so much active in buying all the rivals. So these companies are creating an ecosystem of companies. So Facebook, what is Facebook? Facebook is WhatsApp now. It's a messaging system. What is Facebook? It's Instagram now. So it's huge. It has a huge advertisement potential. So it eats all its rivals one by one and you end up with only one company. And we've never seen such active companies. I mean, if you look at the other traditional companies, look at production industries. Do they do this? They don't do this. Do they buy their rivals just because they wanna get rid of them? They don't do this. There is a feasibility in their buying structure. Or if you look at Google, Google, what is Google? For everyone, Google is a simple device that you search it's, it's, you don't pay for it, it's provided for free. And Google became one of, the, uh, one of the big five. And why is that so? Because Google started buying YouTube, Gmail, all other uh, platforms, and it has created its own ecosystem. And up to now, can you believe that Google has bought already 200, more than 200 platforms? So it eats all these platforms. Some of them, it's 
incorporates into its structure and provides a new service to you, sometimes it no longer uses it and it just closes down that company so that you don't have the innovation any longer. So on that side, this is why our mindset and our tools are not enough. They are no longer fit for this active and dynamic sector. You don't understand. May, may I interrupt you just for a, a question? Sure. Up to now, it seems that the failure of policy has been a failure in using traditional instruments because if the policy uh, would have been much more focused on these mergers, probably the mergers would have would have been allowed. And uh, so my question is, in your opinion, why antitrust enforcers have permitted a so large a mass of power buying competitors the same as you remember has not happened in uh, steel cement uh, railroads and so on that's an excellent question and the answer <laughs> lies in the question itself because in competition law we have a threshold of turnovers if a company has a turnover of blah, 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 million dollars, then you start digging down and you either allow it or you, you impose some rules or you, you block it totally. That's how a merger is done. In a traditional economy, it's so easy. But with these platforms, these platforms do not have turnovers like this. Platform mentality works with the number of users. So there is no oh. money exchange. They don't generate that much. So that's the difference. So if you look at how many billions, millions of users they have, you would be surprised how, no. how, these, how expensive these companies are. You would think, oh, they have to have a turnover of that much. No, they don't have that turnover. In, in Italy, in Italy or in Turkey, in my country, they don't generate that, that turnover. So this is why they're always below the threshold. And so we let them go easily. So we didn't block any mergers. And since we have realized it, after Facebook mergers, now the European Union and uh, some of the member countries started uh, revising their merger policy, also in the US, according to the new regime imposed by the Germany and German and Austria, and now France is gonna follow them. They say, we are not gonna look at the turnovers of companies any longer because these digital companies don't have uh, turnovers, but they have a lot of users. We're going to look at every move that a company does. In every merger a digital company makes, we're going to dig down and we're not going to let it go this time. So this is how the merger policy is shaping up lately. Also, the US said the same thing. They said the, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, the US authority for mergers, it said we are going to look down at every kind of mergers the digital companies are doing, regardless of how big they are or how small they are. We don't care no longer. Because once they are small, they become big easily. That's, that's the network effects that it, the, the definition, it lies in the definition. So let do you me see, do, I give the floor to you again. Do you see a future, do you see a future for uh, platforms of little dimension or inevitably they are doomed to be absorbed by big players? Well, looking at, at the actual start, I don't see any future for these little small or medium-sized platforms because they never had the chance to get, into, get in touch with the consumers because the big, big ones, through network effects, they block yeah. down. And these are called gatekeepers, these platforms very rightly so are gatekeepers so they block the gate so these little ones cannot go and enter in the market and because of this the european commission started a new uh, digital acts package it's a digital yeah. service act pa package expected for december if i yeah right exactly. yeah. It, started, it started it was proposed in in january this year and then open to discussions as of june and then they had the submissions from stakeholders. The European Commission said proposed two things. 
The first one is called a new antitrust tool. And the second one is a new services act, which would propose, which proposes a new set of uh, regulatory rules for gatekeepers with substantial uh, market power and substantial network effects. So they have opened it to discussion until September, last September. September, the submissions are closed. Now they are, uh, the European Commission is at the stage of revising how to deal with, how, to, how, how the industry and the stakeholders respond to these two acts. And by the end of this year, hopefully in January, we will have new set of rules and a new uh, antitrust tool. And let me tell you what these two are. Yeah. Let's start with new antitrust tool. In antitrust, we have definitely, antitrust started in European Union as early as 1957 with the Treaty of Rome. And it hasn't, the rules haven't been changed ever since. It's been 63 years and the rules are st still the same. But the world and the economy has changed a lot. As you have seen, in, we had, think of 1950s, 60s, 70s. And now we are in 2020 and it's a new world, totally digital. The digitalization of the society has created other problems. So rules need to be revised. And seeing that these tools we have as competition enforcers are not, are, uh, not fit for these digital platforms, they have revised and they said, okay, let us come up with a new competition tool. What is this tool? It's flexible. It doesn't have any uh, time frame. It copied uh, United Kingdom's, UK's CMA, Competition Authority, Competition Market Authority. They had created something in between an investigation and market study. So this is called market investigation. Yeah. Tool, mark a new antitrust tool. What we are going to do is hopefully, if it's come to effect, it says we're going to see what, what's going on in the market. We're not going to do, we're not going to impose any fines. You're not going to find any infringement of Article 101 and 102. But when we see that market is failing, there's a problem with the market, the market doesn't function well, we're going to impose an interim measure in the form of either behavioral or structural remedy. Which, is, which would be excellent because that would be fast, reactionary and quick. So, so this is, I think it's, it's gonna be an excellent tool for dealing with uh, digital companies which are very fast. Yeah. And Malcolm, da does this uh, new instrument means that uh, regulators are abandoning in part the criterion, the only criterion that was uh, consumer protection in terms of price and, I, and they are embracing a vision of market as a field in which some animals can get too much power and this power must be prevented before the damage uh, will appear in the future because uh, probably the damage will, will appear but is now in the present is not exactly uh, we cannot spot damages for consumers we can only spot sometimes uh, benefits but at the same time there are a kind of secret and uh, um, secret uh, damage that is rolling under the water in terms of market abuse so this criterion of consumer protection is probably one that should be not abandoned but completed with the market analysis you are speaking uh, about and uh, are you optimistic on the adoption of these kind of market inquiries in the european union i am indeed i'm quite hopeful because i think this reform would be very uh, effective because what we are doing, indeed, the Commission, what the European Commission is doing is it's, it's in, in, in its classical approach in competition law, mm -hmm. we were focusing on uh, consumer welfare. So it was quantitative. It's easy to measure. What is consumer welfare? You, you need to have uh, lower prices. You need to have uh, good input. You need to have good choices. 
But with these digital companies, you already don't pay for it. So where is these lower prices? You don't pay yeah, for yeah. zero price. Yeah. So that, that criteria is already driven away. Yeah, yeah. So the, the idea, or I think it would be very, it would be excellent because we're gonna be moving from consumer welfare criteria to the well functioning of the markets. Yeah. If you look at well functions, probably it would be better for everyone. So you don't have to dig down and you don't have to, have to measure what's the consumer welfare because you cannot now. It's impossible. Yeah. You don't pay. You don't pay. Uh, so exante rules. Yeah, exante. Exante rules. Before the damage is done, it, it's better to take a move before the damage is done. This is what the commission is targeting to do. And the second leg of the Digital Services Act package is what you would like, I know, because you, you like to have these kind of rules. It's more of a blacklist. It's a conduct, code of conduct it, for these gatekeeper companies with substantial network effects. But these proposed rules say is that, again, an exante move, it says there would be a blacklist, do's and don't do's. So you will, you will follow the rules and you will, if you are doing this, you're fine, you would be fine, cleared. If you are not, then you would be under, under investigation. You, you would be super scrutinized. So these, for me, I think is they complement each other. These two legs of the Act, Reform Act, would complement each other. All of them target to be exante rather than expose. Because when the damage is done, it's already done. All these companies yeah. are failing. The consumer is helpless. In this new world, we need a new mindset. So I, I personally, I'm quite optimistic. If these reforms came into for, come into force, I'm, I'm sure there will be a good measure and there would be the taming of the big tech because they would know what to do and what not to do. That's, that's more important than, yeah. okay, you made a mistake, you have infringed the law, here is the, the fine you have yeah. to do. Uh, Meltem, are the lines of <clears throat> European Union reform tuned with the lines of the David Sicilian uh, report uh, at the Congress of the United States, or there are some differences? Well, there are huge differences. As everything in, in between the, the two sides of the Atlantic, the rules are quite different in it. Because US, for the time being, seems to be more uh, focusing on digital mergers, taming the, and stopping the digital mergers, rather than taming the big tech, Instead, in Europe, we seem to be more focused on taming the big tech by regulatory motion, because US seems to be very careful when applying regulatory moves. My understanding, and that's a person, very personal impression, maybe you would, you would also say so, I think the US seems to be sort of prote protecting these US companies, because all these big tech are European, first of all, uh, for American. They're all Silicon Valley companies. GAFAM, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, yeah. Apple, these are American giants who are coming into Europe and Africa and Asia and they seem to be stopping it for the time being. I don't think US would be, they seem to be taking minor baby steps, whereas European Union seems to be taking giant steps in in, in taming these digital platforms. That's my impression. Ah, okay. Uh, this is uh, interesting because my impression has been for the time being that uh, the commission at the US Congress has done a very uh, strong work against and uh, quoting many times the uh, terrible instruments of separating the infrastructure or the essentiality, like in the case of Amazon, from uh, market uh, play, playing, from uh, selling. And so uh, your, your, your opinion um, is for me a, a stimulus to go deeper into the US proposal. But another question is, how can we deal with all this if US and EU take different ways. I mean, suppose that you take the way of separating essentialities from market, and this is particularly relevant for Amazon, but also for Google. 
and the US does, doesn't take this way. So I cannot imagine uh, the, uh, uh, it would be a clash between regulation in Europe and regulation in the United States. I cannot imagine the way to compose this possible regulatory clash. You're very right, because in order these regulatory, European regulatory moves to be successful, they need to be also backed by the US authorities. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's very difficult. If you look at what happened in Google shopping cases, Google, Google shopping case was closed down in the US. Instead, in Europe, it was fined by billions. <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that's just a sign. Yeah. And again, with Google Android case is the same. It was closed down in the US and it had a huge fine by the European uh, Commission. So there is, a, there, is a, there is not a convergence, there is a divergence, unfortunately, between two sides of the Atlantic. And this, is, this, this, is, this has got clearer, this separation got clearer, this distance gets more distant. Last uh, September, when Vestager, Commissioner Vestager, uh, made a speech in the opening of International Competition Network, and she said, EU's, she was talking on EU's this, this proposed digital platform regulation, and she said she is keen on, and the European Com Commission is keen on imposing similar rules on world's biggest tech company platforms. And she said, giving dominant companies special responsibilities is nothing new. She said, it's nothing new. We have to do it. We've already been doing in law, competition law enforcement. And listen how the US, her US peer said, speaking uh, in the same conference, US Federal Trade Commission, FTC, the similar of European Commission, yeah. he said, we have to be cautioned, he, he cautioned against adopting such a regulatory regime instead of relying on competition rules. She, he said, no regulatory rules, please. No rules. Then he said, Regulatory regimes can lead to direct political influence, which entrenches dominant companies and introduces artificial barriers to new competition. So he also warned that thresholds to identified gatekeepers, as we say, yeah. platforms could hinder innovation. So they were always focusing on innovation side. And they said, these companies need to be innovative and we shouldn't impose any more rules than all regulations. So we have two different approaches now. It's the traditional trade-off uh, that we always uh, quote uh, between innovation and regulation. So in a way, we are, we are in the same, uh, partially in the same debate as uh, 20 years ago. But, uh, Meltem, supposing that the authorities take the way of market inquiries, uh, preparing themselves also for radical measures as splitting or less radical but important like data sharing uh, and uh, barrier removing and so on. Supposing that this would be the way, do you envisage room for politics to lobby and invade the uh, the uh, regulation more than what already happens today? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, Franco, it's not easy to, I, uh, to divest a company. Imagine, let's, let's talk of a fictionary company. Let's talk, we have a company B that is dominant, yeah. the gatekeeper, and let's say European Commission at a certain point says, Gives a, makes a market investigation in the form of a new antitrust tool and without saying it's going to fine it, but instead it says, let's put some structural remedies and divide the country company into two. That's a very political decision. And imagine, take the uh, uh, assumption one further, one step further, and if think that that's a US company and think how US would retaliate against yeah. Europe or how US would retaliate against European companies in that sense. I don't think it would be easy. It could yeah. be easy, but my perspective, it could be easy if the scenario applies to only European companies. So European Commission would be more flexible in uh, imposing these kind of remedies, structural remedies or behavioral remedies 
towards European companies, but I don't think it would be easy for but, the same thing for American companies like Amazon. Yeah, but European uh, uh, field is not covered with the European digital uh, firms, and uh, unfortunately, and. Uh, you're right. So, uh, I, I, I agree with you that it will be will be tricky and geopolitical more than economic. Let me give you the example, and we we would all agree what happens. We would understand. If you remember, a few months ago, President Trump of USA was attacking brutally TikTok. The yeah, I've, I've written about it. Yes, I know very well. Right, you know, I I know. And what he said, in essence, was he was attacking his platform, TikTok, just because it was Chinese. And he said, Chinese platform was, wasn't good for security reasons. Yeah. He, he was using the security reasons. And he said, he's not going to let the Chinese TikTok uh, function in the US unless it's bought by a US company. Yeah. And in, in the midway, so there is a deal now, so to say, and he said he's not going to sign the deal unless it's an American firm. And we ended up having 20% of the, of the Chinese platform TikTok is bought by Walmart and Oracle, US companies, and 80% still Tencent, the American and the Chinese uh, owner. So this is to tell you, just, just because of political reasons, Company, uh, states can be very active in digital Ab areas. Absolutely. The same, the same is happening with the 5G and yeah. the Huawei. And the same could happen in the future to the platform we are using, Zoom. That I don't remember mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. percentage, but uh, there is a, a lot of Chinese money into Zoom. And uh, probably in the future, we will see the same story for video conferencing too. Uh, let me shift for a while to a more technical question or a more technical, uh, more than question, I, I, I would like to have your opinion. Uh, if you remember the Uber case at the European Court of Justice, the motivation of uh, obliging Uber to ask for local permission that equals to uh, prohibit Uber was based on the definition of Uber as not an information society services because Uber organizes demand and supply, establish prices and so on and so on and so on. Uh, do you think that, I don't know uh, uh, if the new uh, uh, directive on digital service will touch this point, but in case I would be very interested in looking uh, at the contents uh, because uh, the sentence was uh, controversial. And so, you know, for example, in the case of Airbnb, in the first, at the first stage, they decided that Airbnb was information society, so free of permissions. Now, the, there is a shift toward Airbnb as a player that should ask for local permission. So it seems that there is, there is not a good clarity about ex ante regulation in these fields. So this, this field is quite dynamic as well, as we have been following in the Turin School of Regulation. We've been following it in, in many uh, summer schools. We have devoted our time to sharing economies and the best examples or Uber and Airbnb. And what happened was Uber was quite defined as a, instead of defining Uber as a transportation company, rather the European Commission opted for saying it's a, a information society, it's in the, in the framework of the information society directive. So the company and the states are, so it, it's, it's gonna be, a, it, it needs authorization. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it, to me, it's a little too much. It, to me, it looked like a transportation company. And then it's, it's I mean, then Airbnb, they changed the idea. And now they are still yeah. changing ideas because all the, comp all the states and some of the very uh, famous Airbnb capitals, European capitals are 
asking the Commission to change direction. Yeah. They say it's this Paris, time. probably Paris the first. Paris the first one, Amsterdam the second one, followed by uh, the others. And Paris is the leader though. And that's, that's a bit strange because what happens, my understanding is still, yeah. the markets are led to itself. I'm a little bit on the, Adam Smith's invisible hand. Yeah. The invisible hand was let, let it play its role. And as you see, with this COVID-19 environment, there is no demand for Uber now. There is no demand for Airbnb. And these companies are starting to change their positions. Yeah. Uber started, Uber started focusing on, rather than uh, car transportation, it started focusing on Uber Eats. It's bicycle uh, yeah. grocery uh, distribution. And Airbnb seems to be fading away a little bit on the hotel side. So, so they have already changed the style. So this is yeah. exactly what, what we told in the very first minutes of our talk again. So these, di these digital companies are so dynamic. When you try to impose a rule or when you design a policy for them, specifically for them, or when you have a case decided against them, the, the time has already changed. They are past yeah. it and they, are, they have arrived at a new stage. Uber, for the, for the time being, 30% of its functions are on Uber Eats. So it's no longer as active as Uber cars. Yeah. So what happens is when you design a national code for these companies, digital companies, since they are global companies, look at what Uber done, has done in, in China. China, there's a huge demand for ride hailing, ride cars. And what happened was Uber was unsuccessful, quite unsuccessful. Instead, it, brought, it bought the shares of its rival, Didi. So this is how the, the system goes. So my understanding is it's better to, you know, rather than taming these companies in a classical mindset, it's better to do what the commission is right now doing. Do something like a code of conduct, or maybe had it been left to these companies or had it been a um, regulatory, self-regulatory stage, they would regulate themselves better than we would do it. That's my understanding. Yeah. If you look at what's happening in Google case, let's take Google as an example, as a digital platform. What, what are, why are we against Google right now? Why do we say Google is a gatekeeper? Because we say Google, when it extracts your own consumer data, your personal data, and it, it doesn't share it with its rivals. Absolutely. And we, we want them, since it's a gate, you have to pass through. So you want the rival to have your and my personal data as well. But yeah. this time it clashes with Data Protection Act. Data Protection Act says your data is personal. It needs to be protected. My data is personal. It needs to be protected. So there's an overlap. There's a clash between two types of regulatory regimes. There is. Yeah. And then we have on top consumer protection laws. So these three seems to be opposing each other sometimes rather than uh, complementing each other. So this is why Euro on the European level, there is this debate of talking of a one regulatory uh, body that would control and have the ability to, to use a competition law, a data protection law and consumer protection against these digital giants. Maybe that would be helpful rather than each one applying different sets of rules, maybe that would be more uh, helpful. Who knows? There are some uh, opponents on it, but then some people and some on policy level, there is a debate, hot debate going on. Do you, think, do you think that the like European it, Union... Like it too. Yeah. Do you think that the European Union will create a, an agency for digital markets uh, regulation or uh, that it will continue with the traditional authorities, the commissioner and so on. Well, following the uh, talks and the step, the talks of Mrs. Vestager, the commissioner, European commissioner for innovation, and following what the commission is proposing lately, uh, it seems to me that a regulatory body, for especially designed, since they have already designed some code of conduct, special rules for regulatory rules for digital platforms, we need a body to 
use this uh, code of conduct. So I'm, I have a feeling that we, are, we will be following the talks. We may be uh, facing, we may be seeing in, a, in the upcoming years, in very short time, a regulatory body, a one sole regulatory body for these digital companies or digital world. That, that, that seems likely, very likely. And that would be very helpful, effective. Why not? My, my proposal okay, is... Okay, Merton. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, please. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think that you have touched a lot of questions. And other questions remains on the field. But I think that 2021 will be uh, crucial here for the development of this proposal, both in the European Union and in the United States. So we will have another occasion to discuss these hot topics uh, as a Turing School of Regulation. And I'm physical though. <laughs> yeah, we hope to for the 2021 edition of the Summer School. And for the time being, I thank you for your very uh, interesting insight into these markets and this regulation. Thank you, Meltem. Thank you, Franco. It's been a pleasure. Always been a pleasure. Thank you very much.